And as you've already turned to Acts 17, you will find that we are following Paul through his second missionary journey. Uh, It has carried us over to Europe, to the region of Macedonia. We've already been through uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and now 250 miles south to the uh, capital of Greece, known as Athens. Uh, It's the current capital of Greece, and that's where Paul finds himself. That's also where we find ourselves here uh, beginning in verse 16 of Acts 17. But before we jump into what you just heard read, which is known as the Sermon on Mars Hill, one of the most thorough sermon notes recorded by Luke in the book of Acts from the Apostle Paul uh, that, that teaches us about evangelism, teaches us about apologetics. There's so many great points. Uh, we're only going to be capitalizing on one of those this morning, uh, the eminence of God, which you'll learn more about in just a moment. But before we look at all of that, I want to call your attention to the top of the sermon notes, and what you'll find there is our theme for the year, which is the word holiness, uh, simply meaning Christ in us. Uh, Would you count 2024 as a successful year if on December 31st you say, I am closer in my walk with Christ this time than I was this time last year. Would you count 2024 as a successful year? Uh, Growing in holiness is growing in Christ-likeness. People seeing Jesus in us, and that's what we want to strive to do this year with 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 being our theme verses. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And holy means separate. Don't be like the world, be like Jesus. Be set apart from the world and unto Christ. So just a reminder from last week, we're walking through the book of Acts and looking at this historical recording of the early church and and really drawing some instruction for our church because the instructions haven't changed, the enemy hasn't changed, the Savior hasn't changed, the goal hasn't changed, so we can look to Scripture and say, this is our rule, this is our instruction on how we must conduct ourselves. And and glory be to God for obedience uh, to His Word. But I want to remind us of... Athens and what Paul faced when he entered Athens. Uh, there was a, a satire, uh, a satirist that said it's easier to find a god in Athens than it is a man because there were over 30,000 gods in Athens that each had their own monuments, their own buildings, their own structures, their own statues, uh, their own altars. And so everywhere you went, you were uh, overwhelmed by the presence of these idols. Now, as a tourist, that would really enamor you, and you would see how ornate they are and how captivating they are, and they're everywhere. But as a child of God, it would do what it did to Paul, and it says it provoked him in his spirit when he saw the pervasive idolatry in Athens, and he looks around, and he is overcome with a righteous indignation that drives him to action, and he speaks out about why this is wrong, why you cannot take the glory that is due the Almighty God and cast it upon these objects, these inanimate dead objects that were made by man. 1 Peter 3.15 charges all of us to, to have that conviction and to be ready to act upon it by saying, uh, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you and do it with meekness and fear. Every time I read that verse, it compels me to make sure I'm uh, presenting myself ready, I'm spending time in the Word so that I can give an account for why I have hope in Christ. But in addition to that, Uh, I see that it tells me to do it with meekness and fear, which is a a gentle spirit with a fear for God. And I think, you know what? It's easier for me to carry that out when I know what I'm talking about. So you think about it. You get backed into a corner in a discussion where there's a little bit of debate going on and you, you cross over into an environment where you don't know uh, much about it. And so what do you do? You, you have this tendency to get defensive, Right? You have this tendency to, uh, to, to be offended and to lash out, and now it becomes whoever can debate their way out of this the best. But if you will be knowledgeable and spend time in Scripture, then you can respond with the gospel in meekness and fear. 
And Paul did that. He went into the synagogues and he went into the marketplace. Wherever he could get an audience in Athens, he was sharing the gospel with them. We talked about that last week. Verse 18 says that while he was doing that, he was approached by some Greek philosophers. We didn't look at this last week. I wanted to to begin there this week, but he, he was approached by these Greek philosophers who challenged him, and they said comments like this. What does this babbler want to say to us? He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, all right? Uh, you'll, you'll know why they responded that way in just a moment, but who were these Greek philosophers? I think if we'll define their viewpoint and the angle that they were coming from, we will understand why Paul covered the truths that he covered in his sermon that Billy just read to you. So the first group were, were known as Epicureans. Epicureans were kind of like deists. And uh, if you've heard of deism, deism is you don't deny the existence of a god, but you think he's so far from you that there's no personal contact. He doesn't care about you. You don't care about him. Yes, he exists, but that's about it. He exists in form only. I don't have a relationship with him, so therefore I can go about life doing whatever it is I want to do. I can be my own god. Right? He exists, but I can be my own God. And, and the Epicurean philosophers believed that God existed, but he was not interested with humanity, so therefore humanity's main purpose was pleasure. All right? They had this, they had this saying that said the chief end of men is to seek pleasure and avoid pain. That was their goal in life, seek pleasure and avoid pain. The reason why that was their goal is they didn't believe in the afterlife, So this talk of a resurrection that Paul was preaching would have been very stunning to them because they believed that the here and now was all there was. So therefore, live it up and get the most out of it that you can. So it's kind of a hopeless way of living that doesn't extend past today. Seek pleasure in all that you do and avoid pain, and you've done well. The second group of philosophers were the Stoic philosophers. And we even use this in our vernacular today to refer to people who have no what? Emotion, right? They don't, they don't really respond to anything. Kind of like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, right? Uh, so we call them Stoics. The reason why we call them Stoics is because the Stoic philosophers believed that God was the soul of the earth, which kind of led to worshiping the things of this earth. But they practiced this thing called self-mastery, which means they wanted to get to a place in their life where they had such control over their emotions that they didn't respond to positive or negative. And they felt like that was the moment that you had total control when you could control your emotions in the good and in the bad. Of course, that's relying all upon their own abilities. And so we get to verses 19 and 20, and we see that the the Epicureans and the Stoics grab Paul and they take him to this place called the Areopagus. I mentioned it briefly last week. I want to talk a little bit more about it today. We need to know where he was and what typically happened there to see why they took him up there. All right, so look at verses 19 and 20. It says, They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. All right, that sounds good. It sounds hopeful. It sounds uh, like a great opportunity for Paul. But we learn in the very next verse, which I'll cover in a moment, that their motives were different. All right, for learning this new thing that Paul was presenting to them about a God that they were not familiar with. Keep in mind, half the group believes he's so far away you can't relate to him. The other half of the group believes that he's in nature or he's in the physical realm and we're going to control ourselves and we're not going to get excited or sad about anything, right? We're just going to be, we're going to remain constant. This is the audience that he's talking to. But they took him up to this place called the Areopagus. All right, Areopagus is named after Ares, which is the Greek god of war, and the Romans called him Mars. And so they didn't call this place the Areopagus. They called it Mars Hill. 
So Luke called it Areopagus. Uh, this was the, uh, it was a hill on the northeastern corner of the city, a small hill. They, they would go up there, and they would debate, they would deliberate, they would discuss new ideas, and they would kind of bounce off of each other. At the top of the Areopagus, you would have had these stone seats, kind of in a circular fashion, and all the, the philosophers and the leaders of Athens would sit on those stone seats, and they would debate with one another about these new ideas, and really, whoever had the most radical, newest information were the ones that got the most attention. Uh, that was what d- was discussed up there. But not only discussions, court cases were held up there. In fact, the Areopagus court was the highest court in Athens. We would, in, in a Jewish context, we would relate it to the Sanhedrin. It's where all the big matters were carried. So we go up here, we deal with the truth of the matter, we discuss it, we debate it, we make a decision, and then we go down and enforce whatever it was that we decided while we were up there. Uh, so, so Paul would have been put in the center of this circular seating area. They would have given him the floor, and they would have said to him what Luke recorded, tell us more about this new teaching that we've heard you talking about in the synagogue and in the marketplace. We want to know more. May we know that this new doctrine, uh, what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. And then Paul takes it uh, after that and preaches this sermon that we have through the remainder of Acts 17. Now look at verse 21. Verse 21 was their motivation. And I, I think we can draw some application out of this. Their motivation for wanting to hear what Paul had to say, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That was it. That was their motivation. And the more radical this new thing was, the more attention it got the more interest was shown to whatever you had to present. Now, it's easy to get caught up in the new. We're, we're all, we all can be guilty of it, uh, in, especially in a culture where entertainment pretty much drives attention. You, you cast your attention upon whatever is entertaining, whatever is captivating. In ministry, we call it a circus act because you got to outdo yourself every week. I'm going to tell you, that's exhausting. It is far easier to just stick with one book. Amen? Instead of trying to outdo yourself week after week to try to always present something new, when most of which you just need to be reminded of what's in here. Amen? Right? Uh, So we have this uh, phrase, and I put it in your notes. Uh, It's good to hold on to this when you're uh, maybe tempted to chase the next new thing. Just remind yourself that if it's new, it ain't true. And if it's true, it ain't new, right? If, you, if you're ever listening to somebody deal with a text of Scripture and they, they say these words, man, I'm going to tell you something. I was reading this text this week and I want to present to you something in this text that no one has ever seen. All right, if you hear those words come out of somebody's mouth, uh, I, I want everybody to practice something right quick. Do like this. <laughs> right, because if... If no one's ever seen it, let me let you know something, it probably means it's not there. Okay, they've just gotten innovative or they've gotten creative and they've gone a direction that that they weren't supposed to go. If it's new, it ain't true, and if it's true, it ain't new. It's in the Scriptures. That's our measure of truth. And that's what Paul points out here. But these people were, they were caught up in something that people still get caught up in today, chasing pragmatism. All right, so the definition of pragmatism is whatever works. If it's working, it must be the way that we need to go. You can't use that mindset when you're talking about truth. You don't stray away from Scripture just because something's working in the moment. That's an easy way for Satan to lead you away from the plumb line. So we don't get caught up in pragmatism like these philosophers were. They spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And, and Paul had brought to them a new thing. It says in verse 22 that Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he delivered his Mars Hill 
sermon. I've, I've titled today's message, Known and Near, which is one of the points I'm going to make today. Uh, but Paul's main point in this sermon is to show that the God of the Old Testament is a God that you can know, but he's also a God that cannot be worshipped the way you worship all these idols. He's in a very uh, pluralistic environment where there are gods everywhere, uh, multi-gods, uh, multi-religion, and, and multiple idols And Paul is singling out the God of the Old Testament as the only God worthy of our worship, and he can't be worshipped the way you worship all of these idols. I'll show you that as we go through the sermon uh, today and in the coming weeks. So look at verse 22. I want to just start with the introduction. We're going to make our way to that first point, which uh, jumps out in verse 27. But we've got an introduction to this sermon where Paul stands in the midst of that in the Areopagus and he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Now, at, at face value, that might sound like a compliment. It was not intended as a compliment uh, because he's looking around and he says the reason he says it is because I have looked around and I've found tons of gods. I perceive in all of these things that you're very religious, for as I was passing through and considering all of the objects of your worship, in verse 23, so he's not, he's making more of an observation than he is a compliment. And I think that we could stop here and maybe diagnose the difference between religion and a relationship. It would be very helpful for us to delineate that in our own walk with Christ and our practice of worship to Him. So keeping in mind, Paul was provoked about the type of worship they were doing. The reason he was provoked was because the glory they were bestowing upon these idols should have only been given to God. We have his writings in Romans 1, 21 and 23. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory, listen to this, of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So they, they were robbing God of his glory that he was due. And that uh, brought righteous indignation in the heart of Paul. The the distinct difference between religion and relationship is religion is a list of activities that one does in order to get in right standing with their view of God. That is the definition of religion. It is a list of activities that one does in order to get in a right standing with their view of God and put a whole plethora of things in that category of their view of God, Uh, little g, right, lowercase g. And so they they, uh, do all of these things for the sake of religion in order to please or to uh, be in right standing with that God. On the other hand, relationship, having a relationship with Jesus Christ means you realize there's nothing you can do to get in a right standing with God, but Jesus has done it for you, right? And so you place all of your faith and trust in him. It's not placed in all of the efforts of religion. Your hope is placed in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's so important for us to get that right. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ means we know we could never do enough to make ourselves right with God. We believe that Jesus did that for us through his perfect work on the cross, and through his life-giving resurrection. And one direction that Paul goes at the beginning of his sermon is basically God is not impressed with your religious activity. The reason he is not impressed with your religious activity is because he doesn't need anything from us. Why doesn't he need anything from us? It's because he is the giver. He is the, the giver of life. He is the giver of breath. He is the giver of all things. And so he doesn't need anything from us, but he deserves worship from us. And we do so through a relationship with Jesus. 
We believe that Jesus did all of this. Uh, and religion is not about, or religion is about doing, but relationship is about being. So I want to I ask you today, are you religious, meaning are you caught up in exhausting yourself through religious activity trying to gain God's favor, which is an exhausting place to be because you'll never get there? Or are you trusting that Christ did that for you? You know, a, a simple way to put it is God is not impressed with man's religious activity, but he is fully satisfied and well-pleased with his son Jesus. So how about just have him represent you and trust in him to do what you could not do for yourself? Religion is about doing. Relationship is about being. You have to get the being right in order for the doing to be effective or efficient. You are working out of what God has done for you, not working to gain his favor. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's not about all this doing. It's about what's already been done and placing your faith and trust in that work. Now, there's a great evangelistic lesson given to us in the very next verses. I want you to look at verse 23 down through verse 25. And what you're going to see is Paul very masterfully using something that is relatable and relevant to point to the gospel. This is an incredibly resourceful and uh, efficient way of sharing the gospel. There is a way, and, and get this, this is not in your notes, but, but grab hold of this statement. There is a way to be uh, contextualized or relevant without compromising. Okay, you, you know your audience, you know the things, the preconceived notions they have, you know what they have devoted their life to, and what you're doing is you're choosing relatable illustrations that they can connect with and you're using it to point them to Christ and to point to the gospel. So look what Paul did in verse 23. As I was perusing all of the monuments that fill up Athens, I even found an altar with this inscription. And it had these words written on it. To the unknown God. Now, this was probably the Athenian effort to not leave any out. Right, we got a God for every God, we, we got a monument for every God we know about, but let's put one for the ones we don't know about, and let's call it the altar to the unknown God. And Paul says, there's my, there's my inroad, because I know that God, and I'm going to tell him about him. So, so what does he say? Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, that's the one I proclaim to you. It's a beautiful example or illustration of of using relatable illustrations to bring about a discussion of the gospel. Uh, Paul took an object from the Athenian culture, used it as an inroad, and people were able to relate to it. Turn two books to the right. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to show you Paul's mindset behind doing this. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 19. We'll read a couple of verses there. In thinking about sharing the gospel with all types of people, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, now some clarification, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. So if there are some distractions or 
uh, obstructions that I can, or maybe offenses that I can remove on the front end in order to have a more open dialogue with them, and it doesn't require me to compromise truth in removing those things, then sure enough, I'm going to do that for the sake of the gospel. I'm going to seek to contextualize and relate to them and, and uh, come to where they are and explain to them the work of Christ and, and this God that can be known. And Paul does that beautifully in this text. The one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. And Paul simply presents the God of the Old Testament, the God of all creation, as a knowable God, not an unknown God. I want to show you through this sermon that you can know that God, the God of the Bible. Verse 24 uh, says, but this God cannot be contained in temples made with hands. It says, God who made the world and everything in it is too vast since he is Lord of heaven and earth. You cannot hold him in temples that you have constructed. And then verse 25, nor can you worship him in your man-made methods. There are descriptions of how you are to worship him. He cannot be worshipped with man's hands. He is that big, but he can be known. All right, a couple of cross-references that, that highlight what Paul is producing here in verses 24 and 25 is Isaiah 44, 9 and 10. Uh, the prophet Isaiah writes, Those who make an image, all of them are useless. Their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? There, there's no eternal purpose or significance in these idols that you are surrounding yourself with. How about how the, the Ten Commandments started? Look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 6. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments." These idols will get you nowhere. You must worship the one true God, and he can be known. God doesn't need anything from us. He says he gives to all life and breath and all things, but he can be known, and he desires our worship. He deserves our worship. So I told you that we were only going to focus on one primary point of Paul's sermon today. And you say, well, you've already made several points. Uh, but what I'm referring to is, when you dive into the sermon text, starting in verse 23 and working your way all the way down to verse 37, or 32, somewhere around where the, uh, where the sermon ends, what you will find in reading those verses, you're going to find doctrine on, on creation. You're going to find teaching on uh, human race and God creating all, man, all men out of Adam. Uh, you're going to find... God's control over our lives, that he has pre-appointed our time and our location and the impact that we will have, that, that uh, we always say uh, it is appointed unto man once to die. Like our, uh, one, uh, one meeting that you won't be late for is your appointment with death. You've heard people say stuff like that. Well, Paul covers that in his sermon. And so these are things that we will look at over the next couple of weeks. But I wanted to pull out one that kind of acts as a, a dichotomy, which means, or a paradigm, where you got what seems to be two opposing thoughts, but how they come together so beautifully in the, in the character of the God that we serve. All right, so look at verse 27. That's the verse we're going to use to make this point with. The, the eminence of God. Not only is this God knowable, but guess what? He is near. That's what it means for God to be imminent. It means he is close. He is near. As opposed to uh, 
deism, he's so far away that you have no connection with him. No, he is right beside every one of us. He is near, verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So I want to focus on this for a moment. The eminence of God referring to his presence inside of creation. All right, there is a name given to God that describes his eminence, and it's the name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. That means God is near to you. He is among your creation. And if he is inside his creation, then that means that there is no place. This is going to be a double negative, so English teachers, brace yourself. There is no place where God isn't. Think about that. If he is permanently and completely present inside of his creation, then there is no place where he isn't. How would David and Paul describe this? David would say, there's nowhere I can go, Psalm 139, where you're not already there. How would Paul say this, Romans 8, there's nothing that can separate me from your love. If I go here, if I experience this, you're always there. You're holding on to me. Right? So they're talking about his eminence, his, his closeness. Now, this is, this is really interesting. If God is present inside of time and space, that does not mean, because think back to verse 23, that does not mean he can be contained by time and space. He is present inside time and space, but he cannot be contained in time and space. The prophet Jeremiah was wrestling with this. That's why I'm calling it a paradigm or a dichotomy. It sounds like it doesn't go together. And I hope this expands your view of God today. Uh, but Jeremiah 23, verse 23 says, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? He's basically saying, I'm both. I'm a God near at hand. I'm a God far off. Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? So, so they're both existing in this one thought that, that God is far away and the fact that he is outside of existence. That's a big God. But yet he is so close that I can have a relationship with him. So that means he is transcendent outside of any measurable resource we have, but he's also imminent, meaning he's right beside you, all at the same time. It blows our minds. We can't even fit him in our logical thinking. We're, our human brains cannot hold the existence of God. You, you want to have an example of that? Try to understand the Trinity, right? It, we just can't cram him in a human mind because he is outside of all logical thinking. He is outside of everything that we believe is in existence. He's bigger than that. He's bigger than the universe. He created the universe. But yet he's close by. You can know him and he's near. That's the God that we worship. You must expand your view of God, recognizing that he is unfathomable and too big to comprehend, yet... He is close by. He is both transcendent and he is imminent. Uh, Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But then you also have Colossians 1, 17. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is holding all things together. He is... Bigger than the expanse, yet he is personal. He is far away, yet he is near. He is transcendent, yet he is imminent. Paul says you can know him, and he's close by. Do not lose sight of the intimacy of his nearness. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Do not lose sight of the intimacy of his nearness. How would this affect our worship of this imminent God, who is creator of all things, who is the giver of life, who is bigger than what temples can hold. 
then we say, God, my view of you is big, but it's not big enough. Yet I can worship you as my Abba Father. Think about that. The creator of the universe can be called Daddy by those who are in Christ. So he is huge, but he is personal. He is far away. I can't even fathom how far away, yet he is right by my side. And my worship overflows at this huge God that desires to have a one-on-one relationship with me. And that's who Paul is presenting to these Athenians who have 30,000 gods. And he said, let me tell you about the one you don't know. He's knowable and he's close. He's imminent. He gives to all life and breath and all things. Verse 28, and in him we live and move and have our being. And so if I were to summarize this point in Paul's sermon, I would do it this way. And I put this in your notes down at the bottom. This God that you worshipped without knowing, he is so big that he cannot be contained in temples made by man. But he can be known and he is near to those who seek him. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. I want you to turn to Psalm 139. If you were to ask me to to point you to a text where this transcendence and imminence is being worshipped at the same time, I would take you to Psalm 139, and we would use the words of David in worship to this transcendent, imminent God who recognizes how big he is and how there's nowhere he can go where God is not, but he also has an intimate relationship with him. Psalm 139, and just let this minister to your soul today, uh, that this big God that we're talking about can be known in an intimate relationship through Christ. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, and you know my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before, And laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. You see how both of them are present? God, you are so big that my mind can't fathom how big you are. But yet you're holding my hand and walking me through every day of my life. So you're able to worship in respect to the creator of the universe, but call him daddy because of what Jesus did for you. He's far away, but he's right there. And if he's right there, guess what? He's aware of your circumstances. He's in control over those circumstances. Lean on him. uh, If we diminish either one of those thoughts we really diminish the trustworthiness of God. If we we draw him in and we shrink him into a shrine, then we've just shrunk his ability, his sovereignty, his knowledge, his his work in our lives. So what do we do? We know, say, he, he exists outside of my circumstances and he is so much bigger than what's happening to me right now. But then let's go the route of the deist and let's, Let's push him so far away from us that he can't relate. Well, what does Hebrews tell you? We don't have a 
high priest who can't relate, but one who has been tempted in every way possible, yet without sin. God in the flesh came down. Emmanuel, God with us. He, he is intimate. He is knowable, and he is near. And that's the God that we have gathered today to worship. Don't ever stop growing in your view of God. That, that view should grow from now until you get to see him in heaven. He is unfathomable. But don't ever lose sight of how close he is to his children. And how you can have a personal relationship with him. You ever, let me just ask, you ever had the thought of as big as God is and with, with all that he has going on, why does he care so much about me? You ever had that thought? That, that's trying to wrestle between his transcendence and his eminence. That he's bigger than time and space but he's as close as close can be. And I can depend on him. I can rely on him. I can have a relationship with him through Christ. God is so big, we sing about it. I can know him, and I can know him personally. Because not only is he known, but he's near. And so I want to just emphasize, if you, if you struggle in any of those areas with how big God is, how vast His control is. I'd love to talk with you about that, about His sovereignty and the hope that is found in that, but also about His nearness. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ today, God doesn't feel near. And it's because that nearness was bought and paid for on your behalf by the blood of Jesus Christ, by His sufficient work on the cross, and by his death-defying resurrection that brings eternal life as a gift to those who place their faith and trust in Christ. So we want to talk to you about that as well. Let's bow our heads. Our music team's going to come and lead us in a closing song. And during that song, you're going to have an opportunity to, to come up. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, Pastor James will be over here on this side. I'm going to be down front. There's other uh, ministers standing around the room. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, don't think that that window of opportunity is closed when the song's over. Uh, we're always available throughout the week to talk to you about God and about Christ and about Scripture. Those are our favorite conversations. But let's pray together right now before we stand and sing. God, you are so big, so strong, and so mighty. There is nothing our God cannot do. And yet you care about us. So much that you sent your son Jesus to reconcile sinners to you by paying the price for those sins. By absorbing your wrath toward those sins. And by covering us by his own righteousness through his resurrection and his intercession for us sitting at your right hand help us never to diminish your character help us never to diminish your existence but also help us never to lose sight of how close you are with your children we worship you in spirit and truth we we are mind blown by how vast you are there is no tool at our disposal that can measure the breadth of your character and existence and being because you are outside of all of those measurements. Yet we can have a personal father-son or father-daughter relationship with you through Jesus Christ. May that be reflected in our worship Those two things cannot be said of any other being in existence. Transcendence and eminence. Coexisting in one being. And that's the God that we serve and the God that we worship. I pray, Lord, that a couple of things have happened today, but it would take the ministry of your Holy Spirit to accomplish this. One is that people's view of you were stretched. That they stand in awe of your existence. But the second is that they feel your nearness. 
maybe being introduced to that for the first time. We just pray they would respond to the ministry of your Holy Spirit, uh, seeking Christ, uh, because you have opened their eyes and shown them their need for Him, to be able to connect them to a holy, righteous God. Lord, thank you for recording this sermon in our instruction manual so that we could study it today. And may you be glorified in the way that we apply it. In Jesus' name, amen.